Uh, welcome again to a Elevate Rapid City virtual training. Uh, today is another uh, special Ascent client spotlight. Uh, so for about the last year uh, at Ascent Innovation, the technology started, startup incubator, uh, we've done spotlights of the companies inside the incubator. Um, for this month and last month, we've done these virtually. Um, so we've kept our streak alive. We're doing one every month. Um, so uh, happy to be here again today. A um, couple housekeeping announcements. Uh, please, at any time, uh, get on the Q&A or the chat and ask questions. Uh, I'm going to hold a conversation with Jared here for 20 minutes or so, maybe 30, and then love to get all of your questions uh, going as we go. Um, so yeah, please get those in, into the chat box and, and we'll get going. Um, also, um, if you uh, can't catch all of this or if you want to share it or something, uh, you can find all of these on the Elevate Rapid City YouTube page. Um, so just go to YouTube and search Elevate Rapid City and you can find all of the um, past recordings there. So with that, Jared, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, I'm joined today by Jared McIntaffer, a PhD, uh, President and CEO of Benchmark Data Labs. And uh, so I think to start, Jared, uh, if you could just tell me a little bit about uh, Benchmark. Oh, I should say before I turn it over to Jared, sorry about that. Um, this is actually Jared's second time on a spotlight. Um, he'll talk a little bit about the rebranding. Um, they've been with the, with the incubator for a while now, um, formerly with the Black Hills Knowledge Network, now rebranded as Benchmark. So, Jared, thanks for coming and take it away. Oh, well. All right. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone out there on the internet. Um, pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Mitch. Um, I guess a uh, brief history of it is, so the, we used to be called uh, Black Hills Knowledge Network. Um, we are kind of a, a strange organization, not the typical organization, I should say, that's in the Ascent Innovation Center. We're a, we're a nonprofit. Um, we, we focus on, currently we focus on a lot of uh, consulting work that we do with um, nonprofits, that we do with uh, governments, that we do with businesses, um, helping them make smart decisions with data. And so if I back it up a little bit, um, say we used to be called the Black Hills Knowledge Network and our mission was a little more diverse then. We focused on a lot of different things. Uh, in the last uh, year or so, we have narrowed our focus and rebranded to kind of have get a name and a, uh, just sort of a, a communication, brand communication, a little bit more in tune with where we're at now. So what we do is we provide data to the public. So we go out to federal, state, local sources. We gather data on uh, demographics, socioeconomic conditions, uh, different things. And we sort of aggregate it all, pull it all in from everywhere, package it nicely, um, and then provide that to the public free of charge. And that's our, our main nonprofit mission is to get that data and information out there to uh, decision makers of all sorts. So they said nonprofits, business leaders, um, policy makers, uh, get that information out there in an easily understandable format so they can use that to sort of drive decision making. So not going with your gut all the time, not just um, taking a leap, but grounding the sort of decisions and what's best for your organization, what's best for your community, basing that on you know, the best information possible. So that's, that's our mission is to uh, really support that, drive forward that, uh, that sort of a decision-making process. And we do that with our free of charge uh, data that we provide to the public, and then we do consulting work as well to sort of generate revenue. Awesome. Uh, so I'll ask you again a couple more times, but uh, <laughs> where, where do we find that information? Yeah, so um, our new website that we just launched, thank you, Mitch, great great question. Uh, we just launched the new website uh, about a month ago. It's benchmarkdatalabs.org, right? So um, again, the, the name Benchmark, we really use that because we want to uh, encourage the idea that we want to set goals, measure progress towards goals using data and information. So benchmarkdatalabs.org. Um, on there, you'll find a South Dakota dashboard is one of the tabs on the website. And that's got all of the data products that we provide free of charge. So we've got things on GDP for South Dakota. So you can look at all the counties, the statewide, uh, things like that. Just population statistics, some health statistics. Uh, we've even got a COVID-19 dashboard. Um, it's actually been generating a lot of, lot of traffic. We update it daily. Uh, we've 
got, uh, if I can be so bold as to say, the best uh, dashboard out there in the state right now where you can look at uh, time trends for every county in the state. You can look at new cases versus total cases, um, all sorts of stuff, recovered, um, active cases, things like that. So all that out there on the uh, South Dakota dashboard section of our benchmarkdatalabs.org website. Uh, so you heard you mentioned you are a nonprofit. You are the only nonprofit we've got in the incubator. Um, you're a, a, a definitely a tech company in the data analytics field, um, but different from a lot of the more engineer-centric companies we have in the building. Uh, you know, I'm a, a engineer grad from the School of Mines. Uh, a lot of our other companies are. Um, you've got a PhD in economics. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think probably a lot of what um, people in our building would ask um, is uh, at any point, did you think about getting a real degree? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, economics is an awesome I mean, field. It's really interesting. So uh, yeah. my, my real question uh, for you is uh, how did you come to get that PhD uh, and, you know, tell us a little bit about your economics background as an economist. So um, I, I started my, my journey towards a um, I guess Mitch wouldn't call it a real degree. I'd call it a real degree. I, I, I thought that you know it was very worthwhile. But uh, I started at uh, SDSU. Uh, got my undergrad in economics and German, actually, and then um, actually came to Rapid for a year, year and a half after after I graduated. That was in 2007. So it was the the last major recession that we had is when I graduated. Um, looked around for uh, for work. Tried to find something that really excited me, and I just didn't have too much luck. I wasn't uh, thrilled by, by some of the opportunities that I was seeing. So I'd always had this, this dream of being a professor and doing stuff like that. So I decided to try and go back to grad school and went down to uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. So that's where I got my PhD. And after that, I actually ended up in Pennsylvania for a couple of years. I was teaching at Penn State. And I, I really enjoyed teaching. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but I don't know exactly. It's one of those strange things where coincidence happens. So I, um, Eric Abrahamson, who was the uh, sort of the director of the Black Hills Knowledge Network at the time, uh, connected to, with me through a friend and presented me with this opportunity to come out here and sort of take over the leadership of the Black Hills Knowledge Network as they were trying to grow sort of the, the data, the statistics, the decision making. Uh, side of things and maybe pick up some consulting work to help make, uh, you know, long-term stability of the organization. And I don't know, it just kept, came to me on the right day, on the right week, and I just it couldn't get out of my head. It's a really intriguing opportunity, a chance to come back to South Dakota. I wasn't sure I'd, you know, have that opportunity for a number of years, if ever. So it, um, yeah, it, it really just kind of wormed its way into my mind, and, you know, it was something I just couldn't turn down. So I had to do that, that was 2017. So I've been out here for three years now. Um, and it's been, it's been a hell of a ride. It's been good. Oh, I'd be remiss, I'm not sure if she's on, but uh, not to have you uh, talk a little bit about the other half of your organization, Cali. Yeah, so the other half of the organization is uh, Cali Schleissner. Um, actually, yeah, I do see her right there. So um, apologies, Cali, if I uh, say anything wrong. But um, yeah, Cali is, um, uh, she's really great, and I think that, um, you know, I, last week or the last spotlight that, that happened, uh, there's a lot of talk about team building, you know, the importance of having the right people in the organization, and, you know, I got really lucky um, when I came on uh, that we had uh, a great board, but also a great, uh, great staff with Callie. Uh, she's really strong, really smart, and she does a lot of evaluation work, so she works with organizations to, to really try and help them understand what the goals they want to achieve and how to measure the progress towards those goals. So it's again, implementing that philosophy of uh, data-driven decision-making and data-driven um, assessment of where you're at with things. So she does a lot of that work uh, statewide, a lot with nonprofits, things like that. Really good. Uh, I'm gonna keep asking Jared questions, but please feel free to jump in at any time with anybody and we'll, we'll make sure you get those as part of it. So, um, and thanks Callie for joining us. Uh, so, um, Jared, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jared, you, uh, um, we've published several of your articles in the Elevate magazine. Um, you spoke at different events uh, around the community. Uh, as you mentioned, you've got a, a highly sought after COVID page right now. Um, 
maybe a couple questions here. Maybe I'll start with um, what do you see um, as kind of the current trends uh, with COVID-19, um, especially locally in the community? Um, what have you found through that um, database and that research? I asked the economist what's going to happen with a... I didn't say what's going to happen, I say what, what's been <laughs> happening. Um, well, it's, it's the, the COVID-19 um, event, you know, I don't even quite know uh, what to call it, uh, pandemic infection, has been, uh, I think, really interesting and challenging. So it's an exercise and it's some people's first impression of trying to understand complicated data and understanding how messy data can be. And especially when we talk about uh, collecting, and in this case, generating uh, data in real time. So uh, I have a lot of respect for the folks at the Department of Health that are sort of getting all this information coming in from hospitals on a daily basis, coming in from labs on a daily basis, and then trying to turn that around and communicate it to the public. It's, it's a challenging thing. And I think it's, it's even more challenging when communicating that to the general public, right? Um, what do some of these things mean? Why does this number look like that? Why does this number look a little bit different? So uh, and there's just a lot of challenges there. Um, we try and um, share the data with the public to try and uh, give them more access to it. But I think that the general trends have been really interesting how we had the um, Kind of this ramp up in the state and then it dripped dip down again ramped back up it's also been interesting how much of the state dynamics have been driven by you know sioux falls and what's happened with smithsfield and things like that so it it's it's a really really challenging to try and understand um, what could be happening in a community like rapid city and a county like pennington county when so much of the numbers are driven by the other side of the state it really has to uh, you, you've got to be cautious. You've got to be kind of humble as you're as you're looking at these things and not trying to um, make too many uh, predictions about this is going to happen versus that's going to happen. Sure. Yeah. Um, so let's rewind, Jared, to February first or November first of last year. Yeah. Um, prior to any of this data analytics, um, where did you see Rapid City in the Black Hills um, going from your economist perspective? I guess. Yeah. So. If you go back six months, um, things were looking um, looking great. Okay. So right. we have a very strong economy out here. We've got uh, we've had a number of developments across the Black Hills, especially in Rapid City. Um, Ascent Innovation driving sort of uh, business growth from below. We've got uh, recruitment of businesses, uh, big retailers coming in. We've got civic centers being built. There's just a lot of, I mean, that's not even to mention Ellsworth, right? So the, the fundamentals of the economy out here, very, very strong. Um, that's a lot of growth potential. Uh, population was growing. All the signs were very positive. And, and COVID has um, definitely sort of shocked the system, right? So uh, the state just put out their latest numbers, unemployment numbers last week. And it was, 10% unemployment in the state. Absolutely unheard of. Um, out here in, in Rapid City where we have, uh, I shouldn't even say Rapid City, in the Black Hills, very hospitality, um, tourism-based economy, a lot of restaurants, a lot of hotels that have just been you know, devastated. And it's, it's gonna be challenging to kind of return back to that original trajectory. It's hard to say at this point how long that could take. I'm sure it will. I mean, fundamentally, the, the, the economy will recover. It's just hard to tell at this point how long it might take. So keeping on the topic of separate from, from COVID, so six months ago or whatever it might have been, we all have our perceptions of our community that we live in, um, the Black Hills, Rapid City. Um, but what does the data show as our weaknesses in the community from an economic economic standpoint? Yeah, I would say, you know, actually the weaknesses tie in pretty closely to what we've seen with, with COVID-19. Okay. So we have, uh, to a large extent, a tourism-based economy. Um, it's, it's just a major component of the workforce, uh, the employment sector, things like that. So 
it's seasonal, which can be a weakness. Um, it tends to, to perform pretty well in recessions though. The, the weird thing about this coronavirus recession is how hard it's hit the service sector. Usually uh, recessions don't hit the service sector as hard as they might hit like manufacturing or construction. Uh, in this case, it's, it's devastating the services economy and around here, construction's actually doing quite well. Um, so th that's the challenging thing right now is we've seen that we have a, an unbalanced economy and it happens to have been hit very hard by the, uh, the current situation. But I think that the community, the, the region has been addressing those weaknesses. As I said, Ascent Innovation, uh, what you guys are doing for incubating so some of these uh, primary jobs with education or not education, engineering, you know, the people got real degrees, right? <laughs> um, starting businesses and creating opportunities through, through those types of opportunities. Uh, I, I think a great thing. And I think that that helps diversify the economy and make it stronger overall. Um, you know, we're going to get there. It's just right now we got kind of got punched by this virus. Sure, sure. I'm going to always regret saying that to you, aren't I? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make my between two burns joke or something. You right. Know, you, got the, you got the beard. So. Between one power mouth yeah, glass. Right, right. Between one power yeah. glass. Yeah. Um, what is it, Jared, that makes us more recession proof? You mentioned that. Well, in general, besides, besides yeah. the current crisis. Well, it's just um, recession proof is a, is a tough word, but um, because we are um, a little bit more services based, they just tend to perform better in okay. recessions. Um, we're, yeah, that, that's mainly it. You know, if you look at our main industries that we've got here, healthcare is a big one, uh, tourism, so the hospitality, the restaurant, leisure, um, stuff like that, they, they tend to perform pretty well. They never grow as fast. So you, you lack some of that like high growth potential sure. uh, that you're gonna get with uh, more technology focused or that you can get with a little more um, research-based economy, things like that can, can grow much more rapidly and get faster growth. Then they also can contract, and when the downturns hit, they seize up a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. So we're just sort of modulated, and that's kind of South Dakota as a whole. Uh, we tend we don't see the ups as high as the rest of the country, and we don't see the downs as much. So, and we're seeing that even now, uh, as in terms of South Dakota's economy, the impact of uh, coronavirus is not as severe as in other states. Right? I mean, it's still bad. We got ten percent unemployment. I, mean, I don't want to minimize that. But, um, but yeah. Um, Rebranding into benchmark. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, everything's new right now and a lot of changes, but uh, where do you see benchmark going or what, kind of what's the, the strategy or the long-term plans for, for benchmark and yourself and Callie and yeah. the, the future new team? So I think that the long-term, this is, so when I started, um, we, we went through a planning period where we sort of looked at ourselves and we looked at what was out there and what the opportunities were. And we were really excited by uh, a longer term trend that we were seeing. And that was, a, I don't want to say a change, but maybe a, a shift, right, towards more evidence-based uh, decision-making across all aspects of society. So we're seeing more uh, local and state governments being interested in, in looking at the numbers to help them decide, well, what do we want to invest in? Or what kind of program should we focus on? To uh, nonprofit funders, so that the foundations really looking at, all right, are we having the impact that we want to have? How can we evaluate um, how successful uh, these programs we're funding are? From businesses about long-term strategic decision-making of how are we going to invest our money? How can we best you know, structure our organization and make our investments for the long-term? So, I mean, that's a, that's a trend that it's not unique to South Dakota, but I feel like it was really starting to pick up some steam. And it was just becoming more a part of the conversation. And that's where we're really excited by that prospect of where we can come in and help some of these decision makers, right? So we can put the really good information in front of them to, to help them make decisions that will make their organizations and communities stronger. So uh, people are seeing the benefits of that. They're, they're convinced and they understand that uh, there's power there in that information and using that information. 
So that's that's where we're really trying to play. And we're, we're making an impact there, I feel like, across all sectors, business, nonprofits, um, government. And the great thing is, is that we're seeing that from the free stuff that we give out, all of our dashboards that we provide, uh, traffic going up and people calling us and saying, oh, this is really great. And what does this number mean? Things like that. Um, to the consulting work that we're doing with organizations, uh, really trying to make sure that they're, they're using their data the most effective way possible. Okay. I was actually figuring in my next question. So you have those free resources, but mm -hmm. that obviously doesn't pay any salaries. So consulting work, um, you don't have to name an organization, but tell me about an organization and what it is they're coming to you for and how you service them. Sure. Try to understand that. Well, so there, there's two things, right? So one, I do want to give credit. So we, we get um, grant funding from the Bush Foundation. They've been a, a great partner with us um, since really kind of uh, the beginning of our South Dakota dashboard project. Um, they've really helped us uh, facilitate putting that data out there because that's something they believe in. Right. Um, and on the consulting side of things, we've helped you know, organizations like Elevate. So um, we worked with Elevate to look at um, even before it was Elevate, right, when it was uh, economic development. So looking at sort of Rapid City and comparing them to other communities, like what's, what's our wage growth like? What kind of businesses are stimulating the economy? And how can we maybe foster that? Uh, how can we maybe try and find some new businesses to attract? to help diversify the economy. So we, we've done that kind of work. Um, we've also worked with um, um, organizations, worked with Western Dakota Tech to try and understand the impact of their uh, programs on the economy, but also on the earnings that their students are able to get. So uh, there's a lot of different uh, organizations that we've worked with. Um, we've worked with the uh, John T. Bukurovich Foundation. Um, they funded a study we did on affordable housing in Rapid City. And that uh, study that we did has helped launch a number of initiatives in the community to try and you know, bring focus to housing affordability and try and increase um, the supply of affordable housing. So uh, we're, we're trying to have uh, impacts wherever we can. Yeah. Everybody, don't, uh, don't be afraid of Jared, just he's got a PhD. I'm, I'm sure not. So I've only got 20 or 30 more <laughs> questions I can ask him. So please chime in with yours. You brought up something about the community. I'm curious about sometimes Rapid City and Black Hills are referred to as kind of an island community, you know, we're um, good and bad, you know, we're isolated from other areas and that can be, um, you know, positive in some ways, but also, you know, a detriment in terms of our economy sometimes. Um, what do you see as you compare to other communities and how, do, how does that play into kind of how we operate now and how we go forward? I think. Uh, it, it certainly can pose a challenge, uh, especially when you want to uh, talk about bringing in different industries. So just the logistics of getting supplies, materials in and out of the community uh, can be difficult, uh, either through rail or uh, road uh, or trucking. It's just, yeah, we're, we're a ways away from other places. And so that increases the costs of doing business here for some industries. Mm -hmm. for, for a lot of industries, it's not, you know, it's not an issue. If you're um, uh, a satellite of an of a, of a engineering firm, right, satellite office and engineering firm on the East Coast, you're designing circuit boards and stuff. That's not an issue. You can do that work here. Um, if you want to do maybe some heavy industry manufacturing and you've got to import um, steel and lots of different things like that, well, those shipping costs can maybe add up. Sure. So, uh, that, that can be a detriment to, to attracting businesses like that. But, you know, um, there's a lot of other benefits around here that I think can help us overcome that. Sure. Yeah. A great engineering school, a um, lot of innovation that comes out of there, and I think that can help attract talent and businesses. Yeah. So. I didn't have 20 to <laughs> Running out of steam. <laughs> uh, so, I guess I'm, I'm trying to, to, to really draw the nuggets out of you here, Jared, um, yeah. and you're giving some great ones. But uh, kind of where, I'll, I'll, I'll just straight out ask you, where, are you, where do you see us going when this is over? I mean, you, you don't have to pick the date when it's over, but, um, and you know, what do you see as the, the main drivers to, to bring this out of the, 
this as quickly as possible. I mean, you're, I mean, you're on video, but you're not on record, I guess. So. <laughs> I think if you're on video on the internet, you are on record. Oh, okay. yeah, I think that's how that works. Um, you know, I am hesitant to step too far out. It's totally unknown. We've never seen anything like this before. Um, I think it's it's going to be a challenge, right? I think there's just going to be a number of businesses that we lose, and they might not come back. And so I think the key is going to be having resources um, available for new entrepreneurs to try and come in and fill those shoes, right? Um, we've got a pretty strong entrepreneurial spirit out here. I think we've got you know, some great resources for uh, new businesses that want to come in and try things. Uh, the problem is going to be, you know, can the current businesses weather the storm? And if they can't, um, and we certainly hope that they do, right? That everyone can. But if, if they're not able to, how do we find new businesses that can come in and sort of fill that void? How do we find new entrepreneurs and new business leaders that uh, can either try and replace those in some way or develop new products or new services that people will, will enjoy and demand? So I think that's going to be the real challenge. Uh, or I should say, fortunately, as just a, an economist, I don't have to be involved with the dirty right. work of building this yeah. and making it all happen. So. Um, I'll just uh, be the cheerleader. Yeah. Oh, you can always count on a fellow professor here to get, get involved in the conversation. So <laughs> thanks, Aaron. Uh, I don't know if you can see that, Jared. Uh, as the Ellsworth start to expand, do you have factors that for how that translates to additional private sector jobs, mm -hmm. i.e. for every, a thousand, every X thousand new military members that creates X healthcare jobs, X retail jobs, et cetera? What do you, do you yeah. have an idea of what that looks like? There, there is isn't a a specific number, and I know that that's um, always nice to have. There is a multiplier, so that that exists, and I don't know it off the top of my head, and I'm not going to speculate and tell you it's uh, three or four or five or six or you know point one. Um, it's it exists out there, and the great thing about the Ellsworth, the opportunity there is profound, right? So when we look at um, X thousand airmen that could come in. And again, we don't even know what that number is. Um, what you're gonna have is increased demand for healthcare services, for educational services, um, for just services in general, but also for goods. It, it's, it's going to happen. And you also, what I think is really interesting, and I, I, I know people are talking about it. I don't know if people talk about it enough, but there's gonna be an opportunity for new, sort of if you think about it, business to business services. Right. So you're going to have an opportunity for lots of uh, businesses to crop up that serve the Air Force, that okay. serve that deployment, whether it be from just maintenance to high-end value-added uh, precision manufacturing, things like that. And, and that's what really excites me is the opportunity to sort of, you know, develop that corridor all the way from Rapid City up to Spearfish uh, to really kind of integrate that Black Hills economy even more. There, there's going to be room for new businesses to, to crop up in, in Sturgis that are, that are servicing the base, that are servicing uh, the expanded economy that will show up as a result of that. Yeah. It's, it's an exciting opportunity. Yeah. You think then that um, so Ellsworth obviously is nowhere near on the, the BRAC list anymore and, you know, is one of the, the rising Air Force bases in the country. Um, what do you see as that past impact and kind of the future impact, you know, there's naysayers, it'll always, always be naysayers that, oh, you know, what what if that was a, a FedEx hub instead? You know, I know that was a talk for a while that mm -hmm. Ellsworth could leave and we'd be way better off if, if something like that. And that's, I'm not saying that's a, a happening or that I want it to happen or anything like that, but um, can you talk a little bit about the, the true impact that an Air Force base has to our community, both now and as we as it grows with the B-21? Well, I'm disappointed to hear you say that you wish that uh, Ellsworth had <laughs> All right, up, fair. Right? I, I deserve that one. I deserve that one. <laughs> now, I think, uh, yeah, it's really interesting. So um, Ellsworth, actually, if you go out to their website, you can look. They, they put out an annual sort of like economic impact. It's kind of a one-pager. It's almost like a PowerPoint slide. Um, it just gives you an idea of the scale, right? Of how many um, 
people they employ, um, how much salary, how much wages are generated and paid to the, to the airmen, to the uh, support staff, um, ac across the board. And I, I can tell you, you can't just replace that um, in any meaningful way. I don't, I don't think a FedEx hub would necessarily um, replace that. I don't know enough about FedEx hubs, how many people they employ, things like that. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for you there. Now, maybe if it were a FedEx hub, there'd be more opportunities for um, uh, the sort of, as I said, business to business relationship. Uh, contracting with the DOD can be, you know, its own set of headaches. So that, that could be a thing, but I, I think it's, it's really hard um, to, to make a good argument that that could be replaced in any meaningful way. And if it were lost, if we had lost it um, during the BRAC uh, period, it would have been a tremendous hit right. to all of Western South Dakota. Uh, when you look at it in terms of just the economic driver, the size uh, of an impact that has, it's, it's, it's tremendous um, on the economy of the entire Black Hills region. Yeah. We had a fellow uh, client at Ascent. Uh, would you consider yourself more of a macro or micro economist? Please explain if you can. Oh, good question. So, um, it's a fun question. Uh, just as, as background, uh, I mean, yeah, no. So yeah, I, I obviously completely understand all those terms. Yeah, that's what I was going to get to. But yeah. maybe if you could yeah. explain it for somebody who doesn't. Sure. So as background, there. Uh, yes. Thanks, uh, A macro economist is, um, or I should say, macroeconomics, or just macro. When you hear that, is you're typically looking at um, the big picture. So you're looking at. Overall, so the the economy of South Dakota, the economy of the United States, the global economy. Um, you're looking at things like the the business cycle, so recessions, boom periods, things like that. So macro, just think big picture. You're talking recessions, expansions, uh, GDP, right? Uh, micro economist is a little bit more focused. So you might be thinking about um, an individual firm, right? How how does a firm be more profitable? How can uh, the firm make uh, hiring decisions? How can the city government allocate funds to do this, that, or the other thing? How could you uh, manage a farm to increase profitability? Things like that. So uh, smaller scale, smaller problems. I shouldn't necessarily say smaller problems like that. That's maybe pejorative, but um, the, the joke about that you sometimes hear in economics is it just macro is just hokum, right? I mean, no one can control it. No one knows what's going on. All the data is super old, you know. I mean, the lag time on some macroeconomic uh, data is, is uh, it would surprise people where, you know, it can take a year to find out uh, what GDP was a year ago. So, um, like, we're just getting the GDP numbers for, <clears throat> you know, like 2019 in South Dakota kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's harder to predict. And that's why, you know, when Mitch asked me, you know, what's going to happen and where's the economy going to go? It's, you just got to say, uh, it's tough sometimes. Um, microeconomics has a little bit more of a, a reputation of being concrete, um, where you can actually measure things and you can try and figure out what's going on. And, and that's true to some extent, but it's, you can't take it to an extreme idea. So. That's kind of the difference. I'm a little bit more of a microeconomist uh, myself. One of my focus areas, or my focus areas in grad school were uh, labor economics. So understanding how um, firms make those sort of hiring decisions, how labor markets work, wages set, uh, things like that. And my other focus area was econometrics, which is where you get into um, statistical modeling of economic processes. But that also, um, ties into sort of macro where you get sort of like a, a forecast model for where the economy is going to go kind of thing. So do your, your clients come in looking, I assume, more for a micro look or do they want to see some macro stuff or? Uh, you know, sometimes a little bit of both. Okay. I, I would say uh, it depends on kind of the client that comes in. Sure. Um, sometimes, like uh, I mentioned Western Dakota Tech earlier, when they wanted to understand how did that degree impact their student earnings? That's a micro question where you've got like an individual person, student, and you want to understand like how 
the program impacted their wages. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on uh, job training programs. So like try to estimate the impact of a job training program on post-training wages and employment rates and stuff like that. So that's a very micro uh, type question. Um, some people are interested in the more macro stuff like, you know, what are, what are the big macro variables? Um, what are the trends and where might things be going? So just kind of depends on what questions people are interested in asking. And, you know, they're all valid questions. I just have to think, so we're in a census year. Um, so right now, your, some of your data is as old as it could possibly be, I suppose. So it's probably exciting to be coming into a, a new cycle where you get some fresh yeah. macro data, I guess. Um, or maybe not. Fill out the census. <laughs> Make sure you're filling out the census. I um, cannot stress the importance of the Census Bureau to communities like we have around here. Um, uh, getting economic data socioeconomic data, demographic data, uh, is always uh, difficult, and it's much, much more difficult in rural areas. So the Census Bureau is really one of the best resources we have for quality information on communities in the Black Hills. And it's, it's crucial that people um, fill out those census forms, uh, respond to the census. If you ever get an ACS uh, survey in the mail, make sure you fill that out. That's American Community Survey. So the census is every, um, yeah, so the census happens every 10 years, but they, the census every year in between the decennial census, they do surveys to try and measure what's going on in the population. And those are uh, the American Community Survey. If you're a business, you might get, you know, requests from the census to fill out the, the business census. Um, there's a lot of different survey programs they have, but the American Community Survey is a uh, household survey you'll get in the mail. Um, I actually got one in Pennsylvania. It was kind of fun to fill one out. Um, but it's like a two, three page thing. You just fill out the questions, some demographic information, a little bit of information about uh, what kind of work you do, things like that. And those are, those are really important so we can actually measure what's going on in, in our communities and our local economy throughout, uh, throughout time. Because there's, there's just tons of information. If you look on our South Dakota dashboard um, on benchmarkdatalabs.org, um, Almost all of those dashboards use the American Community Survey as their source of information. So it's, it's a crucial information source, and it's about the only data source available for smaller communities. I think here that you take a lot of stock in the Census Bureau. You know, you always wonder, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I filled mine out, I guess, but kind of wonder the bigger picture if it's going to mm -hmm. aggregate in any uh, meaningful way. You know, so it's, it's good that you yeah. put it. No, they're. They're very important, and you'll hear um, people mention funding. So uh, basically, when the folks in Washington do the budgets and they allocate money to programs for, uh, or allocate money to the states and the localities, community development block grants, things like that, it's all based on census counts. How many people live in your city, live in your county? And um, I mean, that's all it is. I mean, that's where the money comes from, and that's where... Um, yeah, it all flows from that. So it's really important that people fill those things out. Yeah. I'm just going to get into my own curiosity here. Mm -hmm. So um, how then, I'm at least somewhat aware that that's how they allocate funding, but then another thing that's talked about is, is homeless counts and how that relates to especially more some, you know, social enterprise and you know, mm -hmm. nonprofit funding. I've got a friend in Orange County that used to be involved in some of the homeless counts and things like that and, and he had his own opinions but just wondering what you think about how that works and if it's accurate I'm not saying mm -hmm. we shouldn't do it but just curious yeah. you know. that's a tough one because i think with the the homeless counts um you get into that area where you're really kind of saying it's good to have some information okay right but they're, they're not very good Okay. And that's not because the people that are doing them aren't trying hard, and it's not because people don't want good information, but uh, the way that they define homelessness in, they're called pit counts, point in time counts. You know, you, you just, you miss a lot of people. So you're going to undercount homelessness by a wide, wide margin. Um, that's a thing where it's like a two, three X difference maybe between 
what that number is and what you might consider to be a, a more accurate true homeless uh, count. So that that is one that's that's not the best. Uh, but again, those definitions are uh, set by the folks in Washington. So how that survey or how that hit count is supposed to happen uh, locally, we don't really have a lot of flexibility. Yeah. Do you think that that two x three x is taken into account, or is that maybe sometimes used as a no? As a I think you've got tool. your okay. your your official rules for how you do the counting, and then that's the number. Wow. And so the decisions are made based on sort of that number. And locally, people know it's not accurate, yeah. uh, but there's not there's not much they can do. We can kind of blind eye to some of those things. Um, well, I would I wouldn't say blind eye, but it just I mean, we do maybe yeah. in the official counts. Yeah, but I think that you've got um, you've got local uh, organizations like the United Way, like the John T. McCurvich Foundation, um, like the um, Black Hills Court Foundation, right? You've got local uh, foundations and local businesses and, you know, local governments that know a better picture of what's going on. And so uh, those folks and those organizations, they, they make their decisions maybe using different numbers. But when in terms of, it, you know, what's the allocation that Rapid City gets from the federal government or from the state government about homelessness, um, those definitions matter for that. But in terms of the the local support, and there is a lot of local support that comes from uh, you know nonprofits and foundations to, to tackle those kind of issues, they're I would say they're better informed okay. about the reality on the ground. Mark City here. Yeah. Uh, well, Jared, I'm going to give you about 15 minutes of your day back here. I think <laughs> um, so. I'm going to close, and then I'm going to give you the last word here. So uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. We'll give all of you uh, 15 minutes of your day back as well. Um, for more information about um, this webinar and others, um, go to YouTube and search Elevate Rapid City and subscribe. Uh, you'll get notified as soon as this one is uh, finished and uploaded. Um, BenchmarkDataLabs.org um, for more information about um, Jared and Callie and, and their work. Um, for more information about um, Jared and all the companies at Ascent Innovation, that's ascent-innovation.com. Um, ElevateRapidCity.com um, can lead you to those, all those places as well. Um, so again, thanks so much for joining us. Jerry, you to you for the last word. <laughs> anything, anything you want to leave us with? Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, I, I really am uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, thankful to uh, you know the folks at Elevate for uh, at Ascent for kind of giving us access to, to their resources and knowledge as we try and grow and, and develop our company. Um, it is, it has been great to have access to that kind of expertise and that kind of, um, you know, network to figure things out as, as we figure out how to um, become a better organization, a stronger organization. Because, you know, I mentioned earlier the importance of evidence-based decision-making, looking at the information, uh, basing your decisions on that. Um, we try and do that too. So we go to the people that have the information we need and the resources we need to try and uh, be better ourselves. And you know, you guys have been uh, throughout the years a, a great, great resource, and we're we're very thankful for that. Yeah, great partnership for sure. All right, thanks everybody. Stay safe, and uh, we'll look to see you next month for another spotlight and for other webinars.